Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Feel Freaking Amazing Five Journeys podcast. I'm Dr. Wendy Trubo. Ed is again not with us. He's seeing patients, so I'm on my own, but it's a great conversation because we have Dr. Jennifer Rollins. She is an integrative medicine trained OBGYN, so after my own heart. She specializes in PCOS, hormones, gut health. She's also the SHEO of Well Women MD, where she partners with women to discover the root cause of their symptoms so they can have energy, predictability stability in their periods, weight, fertility, and most importantly, feel like themselves again. So Dr. Jen, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm excited to chat with you today. Me too. So, so I mean, you and I both learned about PCOS in residency, but did it catch your heart and soul at that point? Or like, how do you decide, okay, I'm going to focus on this? So my own personal health journey is what led me to PCOS because I had infertility and was seeing a uh, REI doctor, infertility doctor for well over a year. And they didn't test me for PCOS because at the time I was underweight. And so we sort of had that, you know, this is 13 years ago. So we kind of had still that concept that PCOS was only for women who were overweight. Yeah. So, um, you know, they kept trying to figure out what was wrong. I had uh, and actually, ironically, I got diagnosed with Hashimoto's at the same time because they ran a thyroid antibody despite my TSH being normal and my thyroid antibodies were in the thousands. Oh, so you're so, not a halfway kind of gal. You're like a full on. Like, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, there, so you know, REI was kind of looking into that whole Hashimoto's thing and kind of treating me like that. And the more and more time went on and I wasn't getting pregnant, you know, I said, I think I have PCOS. Honestly, I have that terrible acne. My periods are crazy all over the map. I was clearly underweight, so it wasn't an overweight issue. I was fatigued. My hair was thinning out. I was like, something, I really do think it's worth doing a testosterone. So I had that broad my testosterone level, which was 80. And I said, oh, <laughs> lucky me, right? <laughs> I have PCOS and Hashimoto's as my infertility reason. And so, you know, I did the standard, you know, had help getting pregnant. And then after I was pregnant, defaulting back to myself, right? I would get on the birth control pill because that's what we offer patients right. is the birth so control we were pill. trained. Yep. That's what we're trained to do to say it's a, it's a period problem. Here's a, a solution for your period uh, or for your cycle. And I uh, realized I just still felt terrible, like still fatigued and my hair was thin and my acne was still terrible. And I thought there's something more to this. There's got to be more to this puzzle. You know, I was sort of an unusual, you know, what we call lean PCOS now, right? Kind of patient. But so there was that metabolic aspect I did not appreciate in training. I certainly didn't appreciate for the first five years of taking care of patients until it happened to me. And I started going, you know what, there's this whole other side of PCOS that we really don't address very often in conventional medicine. That's really what kind of is my passion is trying to help women understand that metabolic component and what can they do to sort of reverse those symptoms and prevent themselves from getting these long-term complications that we know are associated with PCOS. You know, it's amazing because you also had literally two distinct pathways that could make be making your hair thin, your energy poor, your periods goofy. Like literally each of those causes you to be off the rails. And so you had both. So good going. <laughs> and like looking at you now, of course, I haven't seen you in person, but I would still call you the lean PCOS human because you don't look overweight at all to me when I sit here. So um Okay, so you're and lucky me. I'm also having perimenopause now, so like I. Uh, <laughs> so now I'm like, how do I talk to the PCOS and perimenopause and hashy ladies? Because that's me. <laughs> totally right. So your mess became your message. <laughs> yes. yes. Actually, our second book is coming out in 2024, and it's all about transitioning through perimenopause into menopause because. At the beginning of it, it was really rough. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? And one day, about two years ago, you know, I think I'm a little bit ahead of you because I think, I, I think I'm like done. You know, we'll see, but I think I'm done. But I said to my head, I was sitting in the car and it was a summer day and the car was not on. And all my kids are in the car. And my husband pokes his head. He's like butting around. We're trying to leave. And he pokes his head in the car and he goes, blah, 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 blah. Jen, I have no idea what he said. And I looked at him and I was like, do you value your life? Turn on the car. I'm having a hot flash. And he's like, you know, smart, right? We've been married almost 20 years. So he does. <laughs> and then we get the car going, we get the movie going. So the little people aren't listening. And I'm like, that's our next book. Cause I am so sweaty and bitchy. I am ready to rip someone's head off. 
And that's the next book. So 2024, Sweaty and Bitchy, From Sex to Brain Function, Master Menopause and Feel Freaking Amazing. But I feel your pain. Yes. I really do. (laughs) Yes. So let's go back to pieces. I was yelling at all. I have four children. So it was like the constant, like everybody was making me irritated. (laughs) I was like, something's not right. And then I'd be up at four o'clock in the morning and like watching Netflix. I'm like, this is not, this is something's Uh, not not working. (laughs) So we both have four kids. You made up for your infertility, thankfully. I did. That's good. All right. And so you said 13 years. So you have four kids under 13. I had, right? so I had, at the time I had four kids under five because I <gasps> had twins on my last pregnancy. So I ended up having twins. So I had a four-year-old and 18-month-old and then twins when I had my last. Well, I had a, I had an energetic yes. coach who said to me when I was trying to get pregnant with our fourth that she saw two souls on my shoulder. And I was, for some reason, four didn't sound particularly difficult, but five was like, I can't do five. You tell the universe only one. And so she did and I had one, but she was like, no, there's two souls. And I'm like, I don't think I'll ever leave the house if I have twins. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, there's no way. So, okay. So let's go back to PCOS. Tell me about... Like, what is it? What are the symptoms? Yeah, so um, we, so polycystic ovarian syndrome, we typically sort of call it a GYN problem or reproductive problem because most of the time patients will come into the office and they say, well, I got off the pill and I'm trying to have a baby and I'm having difficulty getting pregnant. Mm-hmm. Um, or they'll come into the office and they'll say, you know, I've, I got off the pill and I'm gaining all this weight. My periods have become very irregular. I'm starting to notice that my face is breaking out. And I just, you know, I have a lot of food cravings, a lot of hair thinning or hair loss. And those are also very common symptoms of PCOS. But there can be some uncommon symptoms of PCOS. There, Because it's a metabolic and a reproductive problem, there are patients who have even poor immune function. So they have difficulty healing. They have poor wound healing to begin with because of immune issues, but they can also have, I mean, even things like funny rashes and, you know, all kinds of derm um, disorders. They can even have sort of what we call those, um, you know, syndromes. So IBS and fibromyalgia and migraines and these kind of other things that go with a collection of people who tend to sort of have these metabolic problems. And so I think in general, we sort of recognize it more or more women recognize it as a reproductive problem because they tend to come in because they're having difficulty getting pregnant or their periods are irregular. But there's so much more to the to this complex disorder that um, I think it's important that patients who are having, they kind of feel like something's not right, need, need to be evaluated for what's going on. So can you draw the line for how PCOS in affects infertility? How does, you know, because I know it, but if you sort of go into like what's happening that women are having challenges getting pregnant. And I, I personally despise the word infertility because you're fertile. It's just dysfunctionally fertile. Yeah. That's a great, actually. Yeah. That's a better term. I, I, I (laughs) I know, I know. I never liked when we would put those labels on the chart, right. Infertility or even, you know, there's a lot of labels in ob one that we don't like either advanced maternal age. Like, that's like, Over 35, of, right? <laughs> yeah. All of those dust. labels that just seem very patriarchy. Um, but yeah, so essentially, you know, there are different ways to diagnose. This is one thing that becomes uh, a problem too, is there's no one set way to diagnose PCOS, right? Some people use Rotterdam criteria. Some people use androgen excess society criteria. I mean, there's different ways, but the two big hallmarks that have to be there is that you have to have irregular cycles because you're not ovulating consistently. And you need to have evidence of higher androgen levels. And that could be by clinical signs like acne or or hair that you unwanted hair on places that you don't really want to be on your abdomen or even on your face um, or uh, lab abnormalities, having your androgen levels actually be high. And that first criteria where I was saying the, you know, the irregular cycles, well, if you're not ovulating consistently, say if you have 12 possibilities in a year, if you had a normal cycle every single month and you're only getting maybe three or four chances to ovulate, then you drastically decrease your chance of becoming pregnant. I mean, it is a statistical game, right? I see the people, if you're going to have an egg, you need to flood it with sperm. It's just a statistical probability. And so you need to make sure that there's sperm waiting for the egg. But if you don't get the egg, the sperm are just hanging out, loitering, you know, waiting. Yeah. Yeah. And even some people with PCOS um, may ovulate in a very outside the normal window, right? So they might have like 37 day cycle. And instead of it being, you know, 
day four, 12 to 14, like the app say, it's like 16 or 17 for them. And say so sometimes they just frankly miss the window. <laughs> so you may even get a limited amount of time. But on top of that, not even understanding that your window is a little different timing. And so that can happen where patients will come in and say, I tried those ovulation tests. They're positive all the time, which is, you know, happens with PCOS because the higher LH that they are have all the time. And they really kind of can be missing that possibility of when it happens. And you bring up a really good point. Like I'm actually on one, you know, these four kids, my kids are older. My oldest is going to college next year and my youngest is 11. So it sounds like my youngest is a little bit older than your oldest maybe or similar ages. So anyway, I'm really on one of my kids' schools because they're not teaching sex ed and I'm going crazy. I'm like, I am an OBGYN. These kids need to be taught sex ed, but it's really poignant that you talk about because we're not necessarily taught what are the signs of ovulation? What happens, you know, as you ovulate, your sex drive goes up because we are programmed to get pregnant. You know, we have, as we ovulate, we have more sex drive. We get more mucus. I love the word spin barkite. It always just was really cool. And like seeing the spin barkite mucus that you can stretch, but then also the height of the cervix in the vagina comes lower. And then after ovulation, it goes up and all these signs women can use, but often they're not even aware like, oh, oh, not only is it the PMS stuff, but but it's really even understanding, how do I know if I'm ovulating? So I think that's really important for women to be taught. I'm going to go back to my kids' school now that they're back from break and be like, okay, what's happening with this? Because you know it's really important to teach people. So if you're listening, yeah. those are signs. Yeah. And for you know, those are the bonuses and the negatives, also the apps that are out there, right? I love a lot of younger patients come in and they're always asking me, here's what my app said, here's what my app said. And and the bonus is that I think some of these can do a great job with education and and teaching women like, hey, look for this. Hey, here's ideas, here's this. But it can also, for those that have PCOS, be very difficult because they can be very inaccurate for them who are not having regular cycles and can oftentimes sort of not be inclusive, you know, inclusion kind of with those types of patients who are like, well, what does that mean for me? <laughs> like, what, what, what's going on with me? So I, and, and I have younger patients who will rely on them and then they don't bring that information to me because they, they're using the apps, you know? And so sometimes I'm kind of like, wait, we still have to kind of go back to the basics and kind of, you know, here's what's happening to your body. Here's what you're looking for. This is what you should report if it's, if you don't have this. So I think, so. you know, we kind of rely on technology sometimes for good, but sometimes it can be hindering for some patients. Sure. Is there a PCOS specific tracker? No, not, not yet. that I'm aware of. I do know that there are um, some of those apps you can literally say, okay, my cycle length is here and kind of adjust it a little bit um, or literally use it as a calendar and track what's happening for you. But there is no PCOS app, which would be a great idea. It's right. my gift to you because that's not my <laughs> area of expertise, but okay, let's go back to fertility. So certainly missing the window, uh, which is a good argument for if you're trying to get pregnant, you want to have sex every two to three days throughout any possible fertile time, mm-hmm. uh, every two to three days. So what other ways, are there other ways that PCOS is going to impact the fertility other than decreasing the number of ovulatory cycles and maybe changing the window? Is there anything we've missed? Yeah, so certainly the other component from the metabolic side is insulin regulation, right? Insulin resistance issues. If you, most women with PCOS have insulin resistance. I mean, some people quote 60%, 80%. I mean, I think a lot of us in the integrative and functional medicine world say everybody has some little bit of insulin resistance, even if you're a lean PCOS patient. And so certainly blood sugar regulation can affect ovulation. We know that can affect fertility. We know that when women get pregnant, they have a higher risk of miscarriage if they have blood sugar problems, if they're pre-diabetic or diabetic, especially diabetic. So that's a component of PCOS that comes in there. And then inflammation. I mean, we can look at our fellow endo buddies and know that inflammation prevents ovulation because that's, I mean, that's what endo is, is sort of an inflammatory state. So you have these pieces of PCOS that often aren't put into the, the puzzle, um, which is inflammation, insulin resistance that also need to be addressed when you're when you're seeing someone who's like, well, how do I get pregnant? Well, we need to make sure, do you have insulin resistance? Let's test. Do you have inflammation? Let's test. If we do- Are, are you human? You totally have inflammation, right? And I think that's the plug for, yeah. to me, as the where I sit, if you have any type of metabolic dysfunction, 
you're a toxins patient until proven otherwise, because those are so inflammatory and so disruptive that that's, if that's the pathway you're going to walk down, we need to make sure that we pull that off. And of course, if we're going to deal with the foundations of eat, sleep, move, poop, have relationships that are healthy, eat food that works for you. But then it's, to me, it's also like, how do we get rid of those toxins that are throwing off your system? Cause uh-huh. it's such, it's such an inflammatory event. It's not even an event as milieu. Right? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we so much good data is now coming out, looking at um, what we're actually exposed to. I know you know this, given what the book you wrote, but, you know, the looking at like children that are born, you know, like newborns and like what was in their system, right? What was in the mom's system when she was pregnant? What are they exposed to? And so, you know, that that's clearly is an issue with infertility as well. So trying to sort of look at what can we do that can really move the needle for our health when we're trying to get pregnant, but certainly while we're pregnant, (laughs) we, we do so much when we're pregnant to like, you know, not be in a loud room in a concert, but yet we don't really think like, oh, I'm, you know, drinking from all this crazy plastic and I'm holding on the, the receipt from Walmart with the BPA, you know, like we don't sort of think about these obvious things when we're, we're so focused on things that are, you know, that, that may or actually not do anything <laughs> like being at a concert is not going to harm your baby. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like patients will say that, you know, they're just so, cons- I can't take Prilosec. That's going to hurt my baby. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> What's worse is actually all the other things that is, that are going on, you know? Yeah. And I, and again, I would say this is, a, I mean, think about anytime you're pregnant, your baby gets 50% of the toxins in your system. It's it's a detox. De- pregnancy and nursing are a detox event for you and a tox up event for the baby. So it's an argument for if you're listening and you have PCOS or any type of metabolic dysfunction and you're thinking of getting pregnant, you're going to want to deal with your talk, to- you know, take hit pause and detox so that you're because it does cross the placenta so the more you can do pre-pregnancy the better don't get stuck thinking you have to deal with all of it because you're never going to it's it's really a process but get the bulk of it down get the get the nasty stuff out yeah and i think on the other end of the spectrum since we mentioned perimenopause too you know those patients too are so high risk for diabetes chronic diseases like hypertension cardiovascular issues like heart attack stroke obesity all these things and so much of those, I mean, I don't want to sound negative, but it, you are kind of a setup already from having PCOS and you hit perimenopause. So toxin exposure is incredibly important, right? You want to hold on to that little bit of estrogen progesterone <laughs> that you have <laughs> before you can't. And so being overly burdened by toxins at that time is critical as well, because then you're, you know, your body's spending so much time dealing with that. It has no time to sort of store the good stuff. <laughs> So, so Jen, talk to me about, is it that PCOS negatively impacts menopause or the process of going through perimenopause into, into menopause is, is worse, it uh, negatively impacts PCOS and the, and the sort of tendencies you have? Like, do you have a sense of which, which bothers which more, I guess is the term? Like, it feels like men, the process of becoming less resilient will exacerbate your PCOS into worsened metabolic dysfunction. Um, exactly. A, yeah, right. I think it's, you know, being being the fact that by PCOS and in your 40s, you're going to have this sort of testosterone level that's higher, right, than the average sort of 40-year-old walking around, typically. Right. Um, this sort of lower progesterone, higher estrogen state. And so, and, and you may have insulin resistance as well. And we know just frankly, nothing to do with PCOS, women who go through perimenopause, menopause, insulin resistance issue goes up. So you're talking about compounding problems, right? So that someone who's sort of already in this metabolic dysfunction and perimenopause alone sort of puts you in a metabolic dysfunction. (laughs) So the two don't make each other better. Do you know, like oftentimes I hear from PCOS patients who are perimenopausal who are like, man, this is like, I had everything under control and now just like a, you know, slippery slope to go off. Bam. And Bam. it's like, you have to readdress again, the bigger issue, which happens more with the insulin resistance as you go through perimenopause for a PCOS patient. And I think that's something we don't, we, we kind of do talk about a lot with fertility, but, but the more you sort of like know what's going to happen to you on your PCOS journey, the better off you're going to be able to handle those things that are coming. 
Yeah. And I think what's, you know, knowledge is, ignorance is bliss, but knowledge is power. So the more knowledge you have, when it happens to you, you go, oh, wait, wait, I learned about this. But I want to go back to something you said, because you talked about the high testosterone and the high estrogen and the low progesterone, which is an estrogen dominant state. And I'm not sure that people really caught that you said that, but that was like the most profound thing you said, because an estrogen dominant state will put you at risk for a whole host of other issues. So can you talk a little about that and what, because I know that some people are giving, you know, consistent and higher dosing of progesterone to PCOS patients to help balance them out. So can we talk about the estrogen dominance and then treatment for estrogen dominance? Yeah. So the, the term estrogen dominance, as you know, is a pretty controversial term because the medical community, the conventional medical community says that doesn't exist. And we know that from our textbook. It says like that term estrogen dominance is not a thing. Um, but Just like you know, women don't need testosterone, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, Ugh, I know. Make me grumpy. But, but I often, whenever I hear that, I often ask that conventional doctor, okay, then what is the term, right? Just because it's not in the book doesn't mean that it's not a thing because we know the, that perimenopause, that's exactly what happens is that people have progesterone that falls first. There's a d- distinct difference between and their estrogens, like a roller coaster on the, way, <laughs> on the way down. It's not a gradual fall. It's like up and down, up and down, up and down. And you often see that in blood work. You look and go, wow, their estrogen's super high and her progesterone's low. And on this time, her estrogen's like, okay, but her progesterone's low because you see that sort of transition of what happens. And so, you know, there is no better term, I think, than the word estrogen dominance. I think it is a good term because that is kind of the effects of what someone feels is the fact that their estrogen is so much higher than their testosterone and they should be really complementary to each other. And so I think, you know, by nature of PCOS, that kind of happens pretty often in in a as you sort of age. And certainly I think in that um, perimenopause time, that then that natural progression that's supposed to happen you're already set up for, like you're already sitting there doing it, right? (laughs) From that perspective. (laughs) And so I think that people do notice those symptoms that really get accentuated with it, like difficulty sleeping, like really having insomnia issues, really noticing that hair thinning at your part, really noticing that your face breaking out again, you know, when you hadn't had that happen to you in 20 years and sort of note, and even those funky hairs that pop up from that higher testosterone that can happen. So I think that that's a predominant, um, I like the term estrogen dominance because I do think it sort of describes what people go through during that time. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. I was just thinking about something else you were just talking about, you know, because it's always important to make sure that the gut is functional because you, know, you think about all of whether you have PCOS or you don't have PCOS, you're going to put your bound and processed hormones into your gut. So if your gut has overactive hormone levels, particularly beta glucuronidase, you're going to deconjugate that bound inert water soluble hormone now you make it a free radical that's fat soluble cannot stay in your gut gets recycled into your bloodstream and now you have a dysfunctional pattern of hormone balance also so so i i would imagine that particularly for pcos patients ensuring adrenal liver gut axis health is critical just to make sure they don't go down that pathway even worse yeah, yeah. I talk about drivers for PCOS symptoms. So I, I often, and actually when I do, I do a group coaching program with PCOS patients twice a year. And part of it is really distinguishing that gut health is a, is a serious driver. Inflammation is a serious driver and insulin resistance is a serious driver. And you have to be able to know whether or not you have a component of any of those as driving your symptoms. Because as you know, when you work with PCOS patients, like most of them will say they have constipation issues or they have some sort of bloating or some sort of GI component. So that's, I would say that was the one thing that changed from when I became an integrative doctor to when I was a conventional doctor is I ask, do you poop? (laughs) Do you poop regular? What's going on with your bowels? Do you have bloating? Do you have, do you feel like some foods just don't work well for you? Do you feel like you have, you know, that alternating diarrhea and constipation? Like what happens with your bowels? Because and I never used to ask that in a in my practice for 13 years, but now I'm like, that's one of the first questions I ask. I'm like, tell me what's going on with your bowels. Because if you don't have good, you can produce all the hormones you want, but if they can't be metabolized appropriately, it doesn't matter. Like it's it's all a wash, right? Totally. Totally. Okay. Now I think you've done a really good job drawing the link between PCOS and other chronic diseases, but is there anything missing? Because we've talked about metabolic syndrome, diabetes, heart disease, anything else? 
anxiety and depression. Oh man, who doesn't have that? One of the two, right? Pick it. Yeah, because when you talk about gut being almost a component in almost everybody, like you can't not talk about mental health, right? Because your gut health is so key and so tied to your mental health. And I would say after, you know, the 15 years of working as an OBGYN doing this, I rarely see the patient who doesn't have some sort of anxiety with PCOS. It could be anxiety that's, you know, has happened because of trauma in the medical community. It could be that sort of feeling as though you've been dismissed or you took a long time for your diagnosis or you really don't have anybody in your corner. But a lot of times it can be this sort of underlying generalized anxiety. And so when their PCOS symptoms are kind of getting out of control, they also have worsening of their anxiety and feel that they're having, um, you know, difficulty functioning. So I see a lot of anxiety uh, with my practice. And then, um, and certainly then they're put on, you know, the SSRIs and that can sometimes sort of hurt <laughs> the, the longer term goal because um, it's not addressing inflammation in their gut. It's just saying, let's, you know, produce serotonin, but it doesn't help you long-term to sort of fix the issue. Right. Right. Okay. So how do you, tr- how do you fix the issue for people? What are you looking at when you're looking, but I'm, I made a huge assumption, Jen, let me back up. I'm assuming that you reverse the symptoms and, and the, the experience of PCOS. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, I even use the word heal because to heal, the word, the definition of heal is to feel sound or healthy. It's not curing. So when someone has PCOS, they have PCOS. They're not, I know that some people online say that they get rid of their PCOS, but you don't really, you don't do that, right? It is what it, you are, you can, act, it, those symptoms can be there, but you still have PCOS. But I certainly feel like if you understand your biology and you understand what's going on and what's driving your symptoms, you can heal and you could feel good even with PCOS. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what do you do for, for women who come to you and they are experiencing this? Yeah. So I often, I think what I do first is try to connect the dots for people, for them to understand that it's not, so their irregular cycles, their anxiety, their hair thinning, their constipation are all related and there's all a connector. <laughs> We're all them. one, right? It's all one. Yes. Yeah. So I think <laughs> the first step for me, explaining to people what integrative medicine really is, is whole body medicine, not Uh, here's a diagnosis, here's a treatment, here's a disease, here's a treatment. That's kind of the way that conventional medicine or traditional medicine works. And for me, it's trying to get them to understand first, hey, this is all connected. If we start addressing these things, we'll actually fix some of these other things going on (laughs) just by sheer sheer nature of understanding what's going on. So I try to really figure out what is causing their symptoms. Could it, you know, again, going back to those basics with PCOS, what's driving them? Do they have a gut health issue? Do they have anything going on with their gut? Do they have anything going on with insulin resistance? Have they been tested for these things? And inflammation, where is it that they could have inflammation building in the body because of, you know, exposures or other chronic conditions or stressed out (laughs) or over-exercising? I mean, you know, the typical thing we tell PCOS patients is exercise more and eat less. Well, that causes a lot of inflammation, inflammation for some patients who are overdoing it. Right, right. I think also let's back up a step that if you are in the... uh, typical PCOS presentation, which is difficulty losing weight, the human response is eat less and move more. But that's not addressing the underlying causes of the imbalance, which are, well, to me, toxins. Are there any any other things that are leading to that that I might we might not have talked about? The weight gain specifically, you mean? Uh, just actually developing, P, you know, P, developing PCOS. It, what comes first, right? So do you do, do you gain more weight and that is increasing aromatization in the fat cells? So that's altering your estrogen levels and that's leading to the presentation of PCOS? Or do you feel more that the PCOS intrinsic imbalances lead to the weight gain? What do you think is the chicken or the egg? Do you have a sense of that? Yeah, I think the intrinsic imbalances are causing issues because if you have insulin resistance, it- insulin resistance issues, you can gain weight. If you have high inflammation, you can gain weight. If you have poor gut health, you can gain weight. Like all of those things can can lead to a side effect of weight gain. It's just important, I think, that PCOS know, like PCOS patients know, like it's it's much better to sort of like look at what can we fix going on with the PCOS and the side, the weight loss is going to be your side effect from this happening, right? As a That's your barometer. Yeah, you know you're doing it right. focusing on like, I want to weigh myself every day. Did I lose a pound today? Is this, you know, we focus just on like, I want to lose weight. This is what I want to do. 
it, it, you miss a lot of the other things, which is to overall get healthy. And I think that that's important to, to for patients to realize is that when they start addressing these things, that will follow. Weight loss will follow. Right. And we find in our practice that when we deal with the toxins, which is a massive inflammatory event for people, weight loss happens. You know, but but you can't focus on the weight loss. You have to focus on the toxins. And the weight loss is the barometer that tells you, oh, yeah, I'm removing my toxins. They're coming out of my fat storage so I can now lose fat. So it makes yeah. sense. So you're really working on the underlying imbalances that lead to the weight gain, the inflammation, the irregular periods, the hair growth or the hair loss, depending on what part of the body we're talking about. Okay. So you said you yeah. do... Pro- and even I'm toxins sorry. is a perfect example. I mean, toxins, so many, as you know, because you do this all day, is like when you start sitting and asking patients these questions about environmental exposures, what is your day-to-day life like? What are, you know, it's amazing how many things come out and then you're like, oh, like this person clearly needs heavy metal testing or they, you know, they may have a mold exposure or like, it's kind of amazing when you just sort of ask those questions that you can get so many answers and toxins, I would say specifically, because those, those are not the, the obvious, you know, like, are you pooping or are you not? Like, these are kind of more detailed questions you have to ask as to what is someone's everyday life like and right. what do they do, you know? And think about, think about the endocrine disrupting nature of all the things we put on our body, all these phthalates and plastics, all of them are endocrine disrupting. So almost that easy, low-hanging fruit is, are you wearing any makeup or using any products that Environmental Working Group has not certified as, as like certified and highly rated? Because by the time you left the house in the morning, you probably used 200 to 250 different endocrine disrupting products. And so certainly, I mean, that's a toxin right there. So it's it's amazing. Yeah, I think there's such a great opportunity to even drill into, did you ever live, work, go to school in or travel in something that was water damaged? Because 50% of buildings have water damage. So when you think about those statistics, the chance of you not being exposed is practically zero as you think of going through your life. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, exactly. And I think those are definitely less talked about in medicine. So those are things that I find when I start talking to patients they are like, oh yeah, actually I, you know, I don't ever look at, you know, what's, I don't, don't ever look at the skin deep site or I never sort of look at what I use or, or even just like getting rid of stuff you haven't used in a long time. Right. I mean, that happens. Sometimes I have conversations with patients are like, <laughs> they pull out the drawer of their makeup and it's, they've had it for like five years. I'm like, you probably need to relook at this and we need to kind of talk about it. So there's, there's a lot of the pieces of the puzzle. I think that, that you have to start with trying to understand with PCOS specifically, what is it that's causing them to still have these symptoms, despite being given the medical treatment that they, that is standard, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Is there anything I didn't ask you that I should ask you about PCOS or that you're like, this is auxiliary or anything there that I want to make sure we cover everything and I haven't missed anything? Um, I think, you know, it's a common, the one thing I would say is a very common problem, right? One in 10, one in five, there's a lot of different statistics. And I really want people to know, like, you're not alone. You're not alone in this. There are people who can help you if you feel like you've been dismissed or feel like you really are not getting answers or you feel like something is really, really wrong, that really to listen to yourself. Because I find that the the patients who are really sort of good advocates for themselves really are able to heal much better than the ones that have sort of silently suffering and not realizing there are people that you can see. There are other um, women just like you. And so I think it's important to sort of listen to that intuition that's like, something's wrong. I ne- I really need to, to figure this out. Thank you for your commitment to women. You know, I know, I know that it started from your experience, but then you brought it into life as a way that takes care of women and helps them transform their health. So I'm really struck by your commitment to them. So A, thank you. And then I think the natural question from that is where can people find out about you? Tell me about the program that you run twice a year. Tell me more. Yeah. So I uh, left the traditional office and now I have a telehealth uh, company called Well Woman MD. And I'm licensed in nine states. Um, and so I see women for consultations to help them figure these, these out and, and help them come up with a personalized plan for how to heal their PCOS. 
And a lot of times what I do is actually give them a good way to communicate with their doctor, right? So they continue to see their doctor, but now they're more empowered and now they're a better advocate for themselves to say, nope, every year I want these labs or this is what I want to look at or I need to readdress my insulin resistance so they can really sort of know how to use the system. Um, And then I, inside of that, uh, I actually have an integrative health team. So I have a nutritionist in my practice. I have a chef in my practice, a acupuncturist. Um, so I have kind of, I'm building more of a team aspect because I think there's different ways to heal. And then I do twice a year run a group coaching program where it's a set of like 10 to 20 women with PCOS in a six weeks. And usually I run it September because it's PCOS Awareness Month and then in the springtime and really kind of walk you through. It's like getting a one-on-one consultations with me, but I broke it into six weeks. So every week we do a Zoom meeting on, on a particular subject and we really kind of dive into how to have you heal yourself with this kind of um coaching coaching program. And I love it because patients ask each other questions. They're just like, what did you think about inositol? And what did you think about this? Or did you try this? And so it's great community. There's nothing better than sort of women helping women, right? Like a community effect. And I think that that's, for me, it's been very rewarding to be a part of that. No, that's fantastic, Jen. So we're going to put all the links in the show notes. So anyone who wants to find out more, will be able to go to the websites that are important and find you. Okay. Perfect. This is great. So Thank you. I mean, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. And to the listeners, thanks for listening to another episode of the Feel Freaking Amazing Five Journeys podcast. Our guest today is Jennifer Rowlands, who is a specialist in PCOS. Look at the show notes to find out more about her. And again, Jen, thanks for being here. Thank you.